The Great Empire of the Dawn is one of the most interesting and least explored aspects of mythology in the world of Ice and Fire. Although there are a multitude of thematic and mythological connections between the Great Empire of the Dawn and many of the major events that happen within the more contemporary storylines of A Song of Ice and Fire and Fire and Blood, the factual information that is known about this ancient civilization is incredibly thin. However, its relevance to the current world of Planetos is undeniable, and there are indications that its importance is actually vastly underestimated. The current civilization that was birthed from the Great Empire of the Dawn takes form in the far eastern land of Yi Ti, and although it is still a flourishing region, its origin story is a fascinating one that seems like it was the source of many of the great powers in Planetos. But one specific bit of myth seems particularly intriguing, and that is the story of the Amethyst Empress and the Bloodstone Emperor. The lore companion book The World of Ice and Fire offers a decent amount of insight into the inception of the Great Empire of the Dawn and the tale of the Bloodstone Emperor and the Amethyst Empress. In the beginning, the priestly scribes of Yin declare, all the land between the bones and the freezing desert called the Grey Waste, from the shivering sea to the Jade Sea, including even the great and holy Isle of Lang, formed a single realm ruled by the god on Earth. This god on earth was the only begotten son of the Lion of Night and the Maiden Maid of Light, who traveled about his domains in a palanquin carved from a single pearl and carried by a hundred queens, his wives. For ten thousand years the great empire of the dawn flourished in peace and plenty under the god on earth, until at last he ascended to the stars to join his forebears. Dominion over mankind then passed to his eldest son, who was known as the Pearl Emperor and ruled for a thousand years. The Jade Emperor, the Tourmaline Emperor, the Onyx Emperor, the Topaz Emperor, and the Opal Emperor followed in turn, each reigning for centuries. Yet every reign was shorter and more troubled than the one preceding it, for wild men and baleful beasts pressed at the borders of the Great Empire. Lesser kings grew prideful and rebellious, and the common people gave themselves over to avarice, envy, lust, murder, incest, gluttony, and sloth. When the daughter of the Opal Emperor succeeded him as the Amethyst Empress, her envious younger brother cast her down and slew her, proclaiming himself the Bloodstone Emperor and beginning a reign of terror. He practiced dark arts, torture, and necromancy, enslaved his people, took a tiger woman for his bride, feasted on human flesh, and cast down the true gods to worship a black stone that had fallen from the sky. In the annals of the further east, it was the blood betrayal, as his usurpation is named, that ushered in the age of darkness called the Long Night. Despairing of the evil that had been unleashed on earth, the maiden made of light turned her back upon the world, and the Lion of Night came forth in all his wrath to punish the wickedness of men. How long the darkness endured no man can say but all agree that it was only when a great warrior, known variously as Hercoon the Hero, Azor Ahai, Yintar, Nefarian, and Eldric Shadow Chaser, arose to give courage to the race of men and lead the virtuous into battle with his blazing sword Lightbringer, that the darkness was put to rout, and light and love returned once more to the world. Now, the relevance of this myth should be immediately obvious to most as the legend of Azor Ahai is one of the cornerstones of a Song of Ice and Fire theory. However, I think that there is a lot more to this tale that could be extremely important to both House of the Dragon and a Song of Ice and Fire. There are actually many indications that the Targaryens are somehow descended from the emperors of the Great Empire of the Dawn. In point of fact, the five forts of Yi Ti are often believed to be built by the Valyrians because they are made of fused black stone that is similar to what was found in the Valyrian Freehold. However, they predate the Valyrians by thousands of years. Ergo, it seems obvious that this stone may actually be the predecessor of Valyrian stone, meaning that the people who made it may also be the predecessors of Valyrians. When it comes to the Targaryens in relation to the Great Empire of the Dawn specifically, there are some pretty overt indications that there is a connection there. In a Game of Thrones Daenerys 9, Danny literally dreams that ghosts line the hallway, dressed in the faded raiment of kings. 
In their hands were swords of pale fire. They had hair of silver and hair of gold and hair of platinum white, and their eyes were opal and amethyst, tourmaline and jade. Clearly the description of their appearances sound quite Valyrian, but the jewels that Danny sees are also direct references to the emperors and empress of the great empire of the dawn. But what's actually pretty apparent is that the Bloodstone Emperor and the dark arts that he engages in also have a distinctly Valyrian flavor to them. Marrying humans to beasts, incest, building power on the backs of slavery, and going so buckwild with magic that it creates some kind of catastrophic natural disaster sounds very much like the actions of the Valyrian Freehold and the eventual doom of Valyria. However, What's even more interesting is the way in which the Great Empire of the Dawn may connect to Westeros and families who have existed there for thousands of years. Because the five forts of Yi Ti appear to be some form of Valyrian construction, but the foundation of House Hightower is also made of the same material that bears a striking similarity to Valyrian stone. Beyond that, Ultra-ancient Westerosi houses like House Hightower and House Dane also include many members whose physical features sound quite Valyrian in nature. Hightowers oftentimes have golden or silver hair, and Danes are known to have purple eyes and pale blonde hair. These families both also originate from the dawn of days in Westeros, meaning that their ancestors were literally the first recorded humans to live on the continent. Now, although it can't be said for sure, it sounds like the origin myth of the Great Empire of the Dawn may be more metaphorical than literal. It's not beyond the realm of belief that one member of a royal family usurped another, and a lot of the more magical elements of the Great Empire of the Dawn actually involve many things that we either already know exist within this world, or which have been strongly indicated as a possibility before. However, it seems more plausible that this story is some kind of folk tale that explains major events in ancient history, simply because when looked at it from that point of view, it potentially matches up with a great deal of what we know or what we can speculate about how the human race developed throughout time. The coming of the first men to Westeros is typically looked at as a kind of invasion, which makes sense because from the perspective of the inhabitants of Westeros, it was. But the long and short of it is that thousands of years ago, legions of people left their homeland in Essos and moved west, coming to Westeros via the Arm of Dorne and ultimately going to war against the Children of the Forest. And they battled until the Pact settled their war for good. However, the reason why these people came and fought so hard to stay is information that was lost to time. And while Westerosi history sees it as a kind of invasion, it's easy to imagine that from another point of view, the first men were fleeing something or someone when they left Essos. Humans managed to live and flourish in Westeros for years during the Age of Heroes, but then came the Long Night, something that the Great Empire of the Dawn myth directly attributes to the Bloodstone Emperor. And eventually, whether it was through Azor Ahai and Lightbringer, or the Night's Watch, or any other heroic intervention that has popped up in legend from across the world, Humankind won the battle for the dawn and ended the long night. These events actually predated the Valyrian Freehold and the rise of Valyria itself, but the Valyrian civilization seemingly developed pretty soon after the long night, and it's not very hard to make connections between these dots. The narrative of how both the civilizations of Westeros developed and how the Valyrians rose to power seemed to dovetail pretty easily with the story of the Great Empire of the Dawn. And if you look at the rivalry between the Amethyst Empress and the Bloodstone Emperor in a more metaphorical sense, what may have happened could be pretty clear. It seems possible that many of the ancient first men of Westeros may have originated from the same civilization that eventually birthed Valyria, hence their similar physical appearances. They may have once been united, but a faction of their civilization discovered extremely dark and unstable magic and another faction was driven out or fled to Westeros in order to survive. Eventually, the magical power of the remnants of the Great Empire of the Dawn became too great and too hard to control. Hence, the Long Night began. And, while the Long Night eventually reached Westeros and plunged it into chaos, the people there who had a shared connection to the Great Empire of the Dawn figured out how to contain or restrain the magic that came from the people they fled from. And, 
While the Great Empire collapsed, the Valyrian Freehold grew up in its place and used much of the magic that had been discovered in the era of the Bloodstone Emperor to build their own power. Now, if this speculation is correct, then the potential relevance to the main storyline is obvious. Not only do the ancient magics that formed the First Men, the Valyrians, the Long Night, and the Great Empire of the Dawn all seem to be resurging in different corners of the known world simultaneously, but a second Long Night is clearly going to be one of the climactic elements of A Song of Ice and Fire overall. So, if many of these families who seem to have a significant part to play also have some literal ancient history between them, it could potentially be a make-or-break element of the second battle for the Dawn. But beyond the narrative importance, the thematic implications of this possible backstory also creates a really interesting dynamic between families like the Targaryens, Starks, Danes, and Hightowers. There might be nothing more to it than the fact that it's kind of cool, but given that, if Game of Thrones is to be believed, the Starks and the Targaryens will have a showdown at the end of the story, the notion that their family bloodlines might originate from rival factions of the Amethyst Empress and Bloodstone Emperor is fascinating. And obviously, in the most immediately relevant storyline of House of the Dragon, again, the notion that House Hightower and House Targaryen might have some ancient forgotten blood feud that literally fueled the existence of their entire families is incredibly thematically interesting. Ultimately, this is just speculation and theorizing that is intriguing because it kind of passes the vibe check. But the fact that we both know so little about the Great Empire of the Dawn, and that everything we do know seems like it could be directly connected to contemporary characters and storylines, is hard to not be intrigued by. And although it could be a coincidence, the fact that George R. R. Martin has positioned houses like House Hightower and House Stark in direct opposition to House Targaryen in two of the biggest stories he's ever written makes it seem plausible or even likely that the Great Empire of the Dawn was just the first world-altering iteration of a conflict that has existed for thousands of years. It's entirely possible that this is nothing more than a recurring and unintentional similarity and the only element of truly important lore that has come out of the Great Empire of the Dawn is the legend of Azor Ahai. But the story of the Bloodstone Emperor and Amethyst Empress could be more vital to the world of ice and fire than anyone realized, and the rise and fall of this mythic empire could have laid the groundwork for the stories that we're seeing today. But what do you think? Could the Amethyst Empress and Bloodstone Emperor be more connected to the current world of ice and fire than anyone realizes? Leave your thoughts and opinions below. And if you're interested in more content like this, like and subscribe.